This episode is brought to you by Communications Training for Coffee Teams, a new Mapper Forward workshop tailored to get your team communicating more confidently to improve general mental health as well as business profitability. Click the link in the show notes for further details. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Map It Forward, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar, and today on the podcast, we are in episode three of our five-part series with the wonderful George Howell. And in today's episode, we are going to be talking about the pricing and the economics of coffee. Mm, yeah. Go ahead, George. No, no, we, <laughs> we have it already. We have. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's yeah. really wild to see what's going on with regards to the fluctuations in pricing uh, over the past, let's say, five years. I mean, it's always yeah. been a problem. But what are your thoughts on what's going on with pricing, the pricing of coffee? Yeah, I have to say. Um, you know, we saw with Cup of Excellence the price really stabilized for many farmers who would win the competition, mm -hmm. especially in the early days, because they won with genuine pure coffee, not mm -hmm. adulterated or changed or, you know, whatever. overly fermented or typically right. washed coffee really well done and who did it the best, right? Mm -hmm. That's where it started. And a number of farms that won in those early days became favorites and bought bought every single year by companies mm -hmm. such as ourselves, Intelligentsia, Stumptown, which, you know, based very much on many of their sales on uh, El Interto out of Huey Huey Tenang. Mm -hmm. right? It established regions and all the rest of it. So that was, you know, that was uh, great. But now today, that's no longer, no longer what's driving it. No. Uh, that's been left by the wayside and you have this move towards ever more fanciful um, processes. Which is very kind of, I mean, if we talk about the, the last episode, it, it seems to me that your ability to push something through social media as a producer mm -hmm. and show your fancy fermentation tanks and, um, you know, become a world barista champion and pimp oh, yeah, out a that, whole bunch of thing. right. of things, right? Like yeah. the your your ability to monopolize yeah. the narrative on social media seems to be driving the price of coffee far more than the quality of the coffee. Yeah. In the case of those competitions, it's the performance is everything. Right. You can win best roaster so on and it doesn't mean your company is doing great roast by right. the way <laughs> and, it, and i've noticed that right uh, and so right. just remember folks when we're talking about the pricing of coffee we've got a couple of different models that we're operating through right we've, yeah. we've got the commodity market where commercial coffee is sold right and right. and sets the base price for the cash market which but it a did. Whole but it Go did, on. and the, with once Cup of Excess happened in early 2000s and so on, and I lost my track there. Yeah, Sorry. it did. Those coffees that won the competitions, right, right uh, really went from the dollar twenty, dollar fifty range, uh, which was also you know mm -hmm. uh, fair trade, to three dollars and over a right. pound. Which, which was, was life changing for producers from every conversation that I've had with them. They said it changed their lives. Exactly. But then it stayed there mm. over two decades. Mm. It went up maybe slightly, but barely. Right. And that did worry me over the last, you know, 210 to 220. I was really starting to get concerned because, um, because. They weren't getting, we weren't really paying higher prices year after year after year. I mean, right. fertilizers were going up, all kinds of costs were going up at the very beginning and climate change started to take place as well. Mm -hmm. right? Well, and then the yeah. war in Ukraine happens. And well, that was already a little later. Yeah, right. that was, yeah, that was. Yeah, the war in Ukraine and the Brazilian frost, not frost, right. but over, they, they were sort of simultaneous. So that's another. Yeah. But That's the inputs area. going up, you would expect if we're talking about the economics and the, the correlation with prices. That's what took the price up again. Right. The, right. the, the cost of production goes up. Yeah. One thing that I, well, yeah. 
one thing that I, I struggle to get my head around is there isn't a correlation between the increase in the cost and production and the increase of the sea price. Yeah, the sea price is another matter. I mean, it really is. Um, to my mind, it's always about building, making the top of the pyramid higher right. and higher. And but if my my the way I see it is the rest of the pyramid then starts to go up with right. including okay. the lower prices, right? And you can't do it by lifting the bottom, the whole pyramid up. But did you see that correlation in Cup of Excellence? Did you see that there was a correlation between cost of production and the price of coffee yeah. that was moving yes. equidistant? What I what I saw was that as Cup of Excellence grew uh, over the years, it started to go to these really fancy things so that the farmers who originally won by doing the pure craft were no longer in the picture at all. I couldn't go to a farmer who was producing a really amazing, a good washed and say, I need you to make it better. Well, they'd say, I'm going to add mandarin to it. It just wasn't there, right? Right. right. Um, if the comp, if the cup of excellence had been totally into that, there would have been a much bigger incentive to build it. I I was thinking why, and I didn't. I never figured out quite how to get there. But ideally, we should have been paying somewhat higher prices every year. Right. So we would have arrived to this price without the shock of going right. straight up, which is kind of what happened, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it became, I mean, over time, it became a new standard, but it was a static standard to a large degree. We weren't, none of us were paying higher prices for the coffee. I would pay a little bit. And in Kenya, I had to select my battles because I just don't have the money to go in 10 directions at once. Okay. So I've picked one or two farms, right? Mm -hmm. and, and ideally a third and so on, but very carefully and very slowly. And it's taken years to invest, you know, in those farms and have them really create higher qualities consistently every year, right? Uh, and to find the, 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 your consumers who will pay for it. Because and that's the other issue. That's the other issue is that right. with the cost of living we'll crisis, getting we're getting deeper into it. We're looking at a recession that's coming sometime yeah. end of this year or next year. Right. Where is this squeeze going to start to find a head? Because hmm. the consumers are saying we need cheaper coffee. The producers are saying you need Some to start are. paying. Well, Some are. right. And One I mean, thing I'm definitely I don't know seeing how that's going to break out yet. Right. And and look, coffee roasters are definitely starting to turn around and say, and we hear it from the importers. Yeah. Coffee roasters are saying that they want cheaper coffees. They have to pivot to cheaper coffees. Yeah, we're not With, whether that's because uh, the coffees that they used to buy are no longer available because the farm mm -hmm. has had to fold or whether it's because there's a shift in quality and they need something for a blend up, whatever it is, there yeah. is a general downscale in the amount that people who own roasteries are prepared to pay for their green coffee. So it seems that what we have is a general downward force I've on lost. coffee. It seems that there's a general downward force on coffee. So what happens there? We're not feeling it yet. I'm okay. not feeling it in my cafes. Okay. Definitely not. Um, you know, we have our major cafes in the uh, in the downtown area, but mm -hmm. we picked it really well. So okay. Saturdays and Sundays are huge, huge, wow. way bigger than they ever were before. Wow. So you guys yeah. are still seeing an, an, an uptick. Yeah. Uh, slightly flat or ever so slightly less Monday through Friday because business, the buildings are not filled with office workers. 
Right. But on Saturdays and Sundays, people come to the city to enjoy themselves, right? And certainly, at least in Boston, you know, the mayor and so on, they see that as where they want to take it, is making Boston a place to want people want to go to, right? Right. Um, How about way, some of your suburban they're sites? They're doing well. They're doing well. We only have one suburban one, but mm -hmm. it's pretty close to where it used to be. Uh, despite the fact that we have now a, a whole other big, more commercial cafe that really, you know, has put out the furniture and the lovely couches and the whole sense of being in Harvard University with the books on us. It's right. the whole scene, right? With terrible coffee. We will not name them. <laughs> you are a gentleman, sir. <laughs> But anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. so when it comes to the economics of coffee, just to wrap up this episode, yeah. where, where are we 12 months from now? In a lot of different directions. We have one company, which I'll name, uh, Blank Coffee. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's an, a whole interesting. Describes end itself of it. beautifully. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I always like to say, yeah, the coffee left me blank. They're yeah. right. <laughs> Right. And that's like, okay, coffee at an okay price. And, you know, I just, what's there to share? I just don't know. Anyway, I don't understand it. Right. And you're going to see well, that. It takes the magic out. At the end of the 100%. day, it takes the, and, and this is why we and people who listen to this podcast. Yeah we're looking for the balance between the magic and the romance of coffee, the economics of coffee and the professionalism and entrepreneurship in coffee. Right. And it's, that delicate dance seems to be headed towards a very uncertain balance. It's, it's we don't know. a moment of change. It's right. absolutely true. Um, so we really have to see because the whole world is upside down. You have the oh, war yeah. in Ukraine, you've got, you know, China, Russia, United States, all, all of it. And on and on and on. I mean, it's like, it's a scary moment uh, mm. on every level. Um, you know, uh, La Soledad that I buy from in, um, uh, in Guatemala, uh, you know, they, they have one of the newer varieties that has been produced, mm -hmm. right? Um, through, I think it's the, uh, the world um, uh, WCR. Um, but in any case, they are, uh, you know, they've developed a new variety that's a hybrid. The world, from World Coffee Research. Yeah, re World Coffee mm -hmm. Research, uh, a hybrid, uh, the H1, mm -hmm. uh, right? Which How's that tasting? Ume. It was delicious. Oh, great. You know, and I have been really afraid of any kind of hybrid because you're starting, you you have some Robusta in there. Okay. Right? And uh, you're completely not a fan of Robusta? No, I'm not okay. a fan. Even I'm though you have, you're aware of the conversations that are being had about how, you know, Robust yeah. is the future and Arabica is going to be gone uh, and blah, 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 blah. I, you know, there's this old expression, I'll eat my hat. Okay. <laughs> Way back. <laughs> right. Shows my age. But, you know, so I, I like to say that I always keep a hat that made out of pure chocolate in case I have to. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Humbling, I'm always, sir. Humbling. I am ready to taste. I have tasted right. Kopi Luwak numerous times. Oh, I hate please it. don't. But. You know, it still never I am gets willing good. <laughs> to concede that I'm wrong, right? If you're wrong, if I yeah, if I taste something and it suddenly it's got that sweetness and complexity in it, you know, yeah, I can see, right? Yeah, uh, I did have one good uh, uh, espresso uh, made with uh, some robusta from India. Okay, quite a number of years ago, right? Yeah. Um, but I've never had one since. Okay. I've I had, had one from Ghana year. recently. Yeah. Um, the Ghanaian government is doing this big push uh, for Robusta. And that's all they're growing is Robusta. Well, see, that's, yeah, that's, I don't feel good about not liking Robusta because it's coffee people trying to grow and trying to make yep. money. We have a... Uh, a young woman is a barista in, in my main cafe, right, uh, mm -hmm. from, from Vietnam, who 
really is asking that question. Right. Right. Um, you know, I can say to myself, well, Vietnam does grow Arabica too, but the vast majority don't, and they don't necessarily grow it in the right place mm -hmm. either to do an Arabica. So it will be interesting. I'm not clear on that. Okay. Right. Uh, we could definitely start, and we're starting to see it, the uh, Vietnamese coffee, right? Which is There's a big boom. Yeah, a big, exactly. big boom of Vietnamese Robusta. And we could we could definitely do that drink in our cafe. It would be Frappuccino Part 2, because that's basically what it is, right? Right. Uh, and in fact, uh, many years ago for the wholesale, I, uh, somebody wanted this Chinese... Um, uh, uh, company that had a number of, uh, uh, of restaurants that they were growing wanted a Vietnamese type drink with Robusta in it. Okay. And I created one, right? Using okay. more Arabica, Brazils, and so on. And it was, I had to say, delicious. That never came to happen. And I wouldn't have sold it at that time in my name. It but, may be the time, sir. Yeah. <laughs> It's what, funds, it's what funds what you really want yeah, to do. 100%. And you cannot ignore that. You cannot no. ignore it. Right? But I don't want to go down the road of blends and selling it either. Right. right? I really want to keep, I want to keep the single farm coffees out there. Well, uh, that's what, you, right. I mean, that's the brand, right? That's, that's everything you've ever advocated for. It is the brand and it is, again, it's it's again what what puts that name out there it puts it's not just us in the spotlight right the farmers in the spotlight too and that's where we need it to be so we need beautiful we need to develop that further right so you know i worry about cup of excellence i would i don't know how they do it at this point because these you're seeing one thousand dollar a pound coffees so that best of panama and other competitions now right just insane prices Right. Um, for tiny amounts of. Well, coffee. it's elitism. This is the part of the pricing of coffee that I have a real problem with. And I, I yeah. you know, we've, that we could go into a whole other two hour conversation about this, but <clears throat> we really have a problem in the specialty coffee industry when it comes to hero worshiping and elitism and yeah. associating that as the marker of pricing rather than the quality of coffee. Yeah. as the market of pricing right but it's it's a bigger it's it's the contrast it's the right. difference uh, it's the novelty of the flavor that's right? you've hit the nail uh, on the head right there it's we that, we value right. novelty in this industry yes far more than we value integrity and quality yeah exactly right so you know on so that we, exciting point <laughs> Yeah. We're going to wrap up this episode, folks. In the next episode, we're going to talk about the cafe model and who better to tell us about the cafe model than George. So mm -hmm. peace, love and pe <laughs> <laughs> peace, love and peanut butter, everybody. Have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks for tuning in, friends. There are two ways you can support this podcast. Firstly, become a paid member of our YouTube channel. Secondly, you can join our Patreon for as little as $3 a month. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video before you leave and check the show notes for more information. Now, this is what you should check out next.